Um, you know, I, I may I may be a Christian, but that doesn't make me naive. I grew up on the streets. My dad was in prison when I was a kid, visited him. Um, and my PhD, my training is in behavioral science. Um, so the idea of David getting over on me, um, or really anybody that sits with him long enough to see that this man uh, really does believe in his faith. I also had two experiences with uh, two other serial killers prior to David Berkowitz that I had worked with within Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And uh, both of those relationships came to an impasse because of the psychological uh, games they were playing, or should I say psychopathic games. Um, so I, I know the difference between the real and the counterfeit. And uh, I would go out on a limb and say David Berkowitz's conversion is real. <music> Uh, we're joined today by Michael Caparelli, and Mike had the, I don't know if you call it an honor or misfortune or I'll say unique opportunity to interview David Berkowitz, a.k.a. the son of Sam, and extracted a bit of a confession from him. Before we get into that, though, I want to ask you one question. How is it you go about interviewing David Berkowitz. Well, I had mailed David Berkowitz a copy of a book that I had written back in 2020 uh, on mental health from a Christian perspective. I'm both a clergyman, um, David's a Christian, as well as a PhD in behavioral science. I'm a professor at three colleges. I teach criminal psychology, uh, abnormal psych. Um, so I, I mailed this book to David called Dr. Jesus, Again, mental health from a, a Christian perspective. He reads it probably in two weeks. Uh, and he mails me a letter in late 2021. And he basically says, I've been looking for a guy like you that has an understanding of uh, spiritual reality because he's, again, he's a Christian, but at the same time can articulate the psychological breakdowns that were behind my crimes. Uh, so David had uh, requested my visit early 2022. I drove to Wallkill, New York, Shore Gunk Correctional Facility, and my first session with inmate number 78A, 1976, uh, began right there and then, and it was one session of 34 sessions, a total of 100 hours uh, that took place over the course of about 16 months, uh, analyzing David Berkowitz both the mental health factors that were behind his crimes, as well as his transformation over the last 35 years in being an inmate uh, in the prison. Okay, now we were actually talking before we went on and um, I had asked a similar question. You said that he claimed to be a Christian and I, I wanted to Explore that a little bit, why you might sometimes say that he claimed to be a Christian versus if he in fact is a Christian. Well, I use that particular verb because I know that most listeners are skeptical and see David's conversion as nothing more than a jailhouse conversion. Um, and I don't believe that. I believe that his conversion was real. I don't believe he should be released but I've worked with inmates for 20 years. Um, jailhouse conversions are typically about six months long, tops. Very hard to put on an act for 35 years. And David's Christianity is not just a matter of speech. He's very involved. He mentors about 16 guys. He leads chapel services once a week. Um, he responds to letters around the world, helping people that are suicidal. Again, do, do I think he should be released? No, but do I believe the conversion is real? Yes. Um, you know, I, I may I may be a Christian, but that doesn't make me naive. I grew up on the streets. My dad was in prison when I was a kid, visited him. Um, and my PhD, my training is in behavioral science. Um, so the idea of David getting over on me, um, or really anybody that sits with him long enough to see that this man uh, really does believe in his faith. I also had two experiences with uh, two other serial killers prior to David Berkowitz that I had worked with within Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And uh, both of those relationships came to an impasse because of the psychological uh, games they were playing, or should I say psychopathic games. Um, so I, I know the difference between the real and the counterfeit. 
And uh, I would go out on a limb and say David Berkowitz's conversion is real. Interesting. I want to touch on that, too. Um, I noticed that the book Ford is written by Michael Francisi. Um, is that some uh, another, quote, felon that you've worked with over time? Or how did that come Well, about? Michael, I've known for about two decades. Uh, I passed at a church for about 16 years in a city church in Providence, Rhode Island. And Michael uh, was a guest. He spoke at that church regularly. If you don't know his story... He was involved in the Colombo crime family. Uh, he was an underboss. I'm sorry, a captain in the Colombo crime family. Left the mafia in the late 80s, and uh, he just became a friend. Wrote the foreword of the book, but not only did he write the foreword, Michael and I went into the prison together uh, with a video crew and videotaped a two-hour interview with David. Um, that interview will actually be featured on YouTube on his channel within the next couple of months. Uh, but yeah, Michael was the ideal candidate because he too... 1970s New York City, David Berkowitz is on the streets doing what he was doing, and Michael was also on those same streets, and uh, both give their lives to Christ in a prison, and uh, both become friends of mine, and I, I felt like he was the most suitable uh, person to write the foreword for the book. Yeah, that's that's fantastic to hear. Um, I know that he's been traveling in similar circles, or people I know, like uh, Sean Atwood and uh, other people, so I was like, you know, that triggered me off and i was wondering if that might have helped you with inroads talking to the prisoners at, at what point you mentioned you start visiting different uh felons including the two serial killers was this just while you're being a pastor or is this uh, related to your degree well the uh visiting the prison was mostly under the auspices of the ministry as a pastor i uh, prison was very much involved in uh helping inmates reacclimate to society. Um, one of the inmates had served about 20 years, murdered a guy, was released. A uh, big six foot seven African American gentleman. I mean, looks like an NFL football player. And uh, he's been doing very well since he was released. I was his pastor for many years, not just him, but a whole collection of people. Um, so, yeah, a lot of the prison involvement was uh, more ministry related. But once I finished my PhD in behavioral science, uh, what what began was a, ser a series of case studies. I did a case study on addicts in recovery who attend church. And uh, that was a two-year case study that was published in academic journals, uh, seeing you know how faith and religion hurt or hindered their addiction recovery process. Um, so, you know, I, I was a clergyman for 16 years. I probably still consider myself that because I still advocate and work with inmates. Uh, but now, uh, the second half of my life, um, you can call me a behavioral scientist in the sense that I conduct research on human behavior, and usually within this particular niche. Uh, just to, um, for my own curiosity, um, I have a co-host that I work with a lot, and he is a, a drug counselor, um, recovering guy, etc. Big believer in 12-step. Is that the program that you subscribe to, or is it something else? Very good else? intuition. Yes, it is. I actually, uh, when, when I pastored the church for 16 years, one of the ways that we grew the church from a small handful of people, about 15 in number, all the way into the hundreds and buying our own property was through our weekly 12-step group. Um, that was really the doorway into the church, and uh, you know, people that were struggling with addictions, mental health issues, attended that 12-step group, and then eventually became members of the church. And I'm curious, too, especially with as much visiting as, as you've done, et cetera, um, are, are the same tendencies that can ca can affect an addiction also seen in other criminal behavior? I don't know if I'm, I'm wording this well, but I'm just wondering if, from one thing I understand, one of the biggest problems with um, addiction is ego. And that's why a lot give up to the higher power and things like that. And uh, until they can release that control, they're never going to start any kind of recovery. Is it a similar mindset issue with criminals? Well, let, let me say this in a more broad spectrum. Um, these are human struggles. These are struggles that you, Eric, and me deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it be ego, manipulation, deceit. Um, the addict is just like everybody else, only more so. <laughs> uh, 
So it's the same problems. It's just amplified to another level. And yes, those same problems that the addict faces uh, when you're dealing with the criminal population, uh, criminal offenders, whether, you know, maybe their addiction was violence because violence can very, very well become an addiction. Aggressive behavior can release, you know, certain feel good chemicals in the brain like dopamine and uh, serotonin that makes one want to go back to that violent act. So yes, uh, the criminal profile is in many ways similar to the addict profile and the addict profile is similar to human nature or is human nature, but just on another level, it's amplified. Okay. Now, what made me think of it too, is my uh, partner said that, especially with addiction, that um, drug addicts and alcoholics do have one bit of a difference. And, you know, alcoholics will have the shame, et cetera. But as he put it, he said, a drug addict will steal your wallet and then help you look for it. Well, I mean, it's, there's a tendency in it. Yeah, I, I can see where he's coming from. If you're addicted to crack cocaine, for instance, uh, the levels that crack is going to take you to in your willingness to engage in the most despicable despicable behaviors um, is going to probably be a lot lower than, let's say, someone that's a drunkard or an alcoholic. So I, I can see where he's coming from. But those tendencies, I mean, I know people that are not addicts and not alcoholics will still steal your wallet and help you look for it. Um, you know, I'm a proponent that, and this is one of the pre- presuppositions of my book. My book is entitled Monster Mirror. It was released in October, 100 Hours with David Berkowitz. First three days in October, it ranked the number one new release in the true crime section on the Amazon. It has sold thousands of copies in the last couple of months. And uh, the, the main pre- presupposition of the book is that we like to think that there are other people. There are other people that'll shoot up schools, not my kids. There are other people that'll commit homicide, never me. There are no other people. Uh, We typically create these categories in our head. I think they make us feel better about ourselves. Um, But I challenge the reader in the book. I challenge the reader that uh, if you mull over enough resentment over a period of six months and you justify enough wrongdoings, you will be shocked at the kind of person you will evolve into. Um, There are 13 mass shootings a week in the United States, 13 a week. That's a staggering statistic, 13 per week, school shootings, mall shootings. And these are your boys and girls next door. Uh, We like to think that there are other people because that's what Hollywood does. It paints this depiction of people like David Berkowitz as a monster from the abyss. Uh, But the truth is he's the boy next door. And uh, that's that's an alarming reality for some people. But if you take a trip through history, You'll see that, you know, for instance, 1940s Germany, the majority of Germans uh, were behaving in ways that they would have never imagined to behave maybe 20 years prior. Uh, So human nature, the potential of evil, what Carl Jung called the shadow, what the Bible calls the sinful nature, um, I think most of us underestimate our evil potentiality and we're under the delusion of goodness. Fair enough. And when you mentioned Monster Mirror, it did make me wonder if you were influenced by Nietzsche and his quote, if you gaze long into yeah. an abyss, the abyss also gazes into Excellent. you. Yeah, great quote by Nietzsche. Nietzsche is, uh, uh, you know, the father of nihilism. And uh, certainly nihilism played a role if you read the chapter on cognitive distortions uh, and David Berkowitz's evolution into the son of Sam. You'll see that nihilism was definitely part of his thought process and what evolved, what, uh, what turned a, a man into a serial killer. Okay. Now I want to revisit back what you said earlier about having spoke with two other serial killers or having visits who you felt were different. And you were talking about, um, psychopathy and essentially games that they're playing. Are you saying then that David Berkowitz is not a psychopath or that he is, um, a psychopath who's coping with his personality disorder. Well, let, let's back up a little bit, first of all, and define psychopathy, because psychopathy is one of those terms that's really in flux. Um, it's not listed in the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Psychological Disorders. You won't find it in any one of the 251 disorders in that book. Um, the closest you'll have to it is known as antisocial personality disorder. Um, that's probably the, the closest parallel to psychopathy. Psychopathy is more of a cultural construct. 
Um, it's a term that's, uh, depending upon what book you're reading on defining psychopathy, um, you're going to get different depictions because it's, it's just, it's in flux. But if we were to take probably the most agreeable understanding of psychopathy, being a person that's calculating, um, you know, not deferential to rules or social norms, willing to violate the rights of other people. I would say that David Berkowitz in the 1970s would have lit up the psychopathy scoreboard. He probably would have definitely checked off quite a few of those characteristics. He lit 1,400 fires uh, all through the Bronx from the time he was a little kid. Definitely had conduct, uh, oppositional conduct disorder, which is typically the prelude to antisocial personality disorder. Um, he gunned down 13 people. He stabbed one. Um, very manipulative, very deceitful. So I would say David Berkowitz uh, at one point definitely would qualify to be a psychopath. Now, whether or not that psychopathy is still there on a genetic level, for instance, the LMMAOA gene, which is the gene considered the uh, genetic variant behind psychopathy, um, if that's still there, I'm, I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, the gene itself doesn't guarantee that you're going to be a serial killer. just makes you more predisposed to... Uh, let's say, risky behavior and a more adventurous personality. They call it the warrior gene. In fact, it's a gene that's pretty popular amongst uh, uh, people in the military. So, you know, does he still have that genetic, genetic variant? There's a good possibility. But the behavior, the fruit, you can only judge a tree by its fruit. When I look at his fruit and I look at how he handles getting angry, which, by the way, one of the sessions I describe it in the book, he had an, a conflict with another inmate, and I watched him for three and a half hours navigate through anger. I watched how he regulated impulses. I watched how he went on, on a journey of self-reflection, which is not typical of somebody angry. Typically, they externalize. It's all about people, places, and things. Um, watching this man, not just his actions, but his reactions, watching his reactions for 34 sessions, I'd say that if there is any psychopathy, it's at bay. And uh, all depending upon how you define psychopathy. And I'd say that he may have it, but it doesn't have him. That there's a leverage and a, an authority that he's gained over it. And he's certainly walking in uh, a new light today and has been for the last 35 years. Okay. And you described something that I, I'm curious that if we have the third part of the uh, triad that was so commonly found. And by psychopathy, I'm going to, I'm referring to the hair sure. test, if you will. I think probably Robert Hare is. is probably the, the most yep. um, ex accepted general use of that. But uh, he's had a but, lot of critics, just so you know. It's not it's not oh, so clear, clear cut. It's uh, There's still a lot of different scholars oh, and yeah. vantage points on that. No, of course, and I, I always find that strange. And then there's an argument of sociopathy versus psychopathy. Uh, whether they're identical or they're not, I'm of the mindset that sociopathy is created and psychopathy is usually born with, if that makes sense. Like um, sociopathy is a similar result that comes from really bad environmental factors, um, upbringing, things like that. And it can kind of turn something That's bad. one way of distinguishing between the two, but I've heard a variety of ways of... Uh distinguishing between the two. I, I, I don't really debate too much the psychopathy versus sociopath distinction. I just think it's, there's not enough data uh, to really speak that deep about that particular subject. Oh, that's fair. Um, so back to it, um, and there's also the dark triad, but I'm talking about the um, triad of essentially starting fires, harming animals, wetting beds. Only one I didn't know about with Berkowitz is the bedwetting. I knew he did the fires. I knew he did the animals. So those are often signs of someone who may escalate into something worse. Have you found that to be common? Uh, well, he was lighting fires, and he certainly harmed animals. The bedwetting was never uh, something we talked about, never something he disclosed. I don't think that that was uh, a reality. But yeah, if you're going by that checklist by here, the 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 uh, the lighting the fires and the hurting animals definitely qualifies. If you talk about the dark triad, which is Machiavellianism, sadism, psychopathy, yeah, you, you know, even that, uh, you know, you look at his story in the '70s. It's pretty clear the guy 
was psychopathic. But looking at the man he is now and how he reacts to stress and how he reacts to various types of negative stimuli, I'd have to say I'm a witness. The guy is a, a new creation. Doesn't mean he's perfect. I mean, he certainly has some character defects. Who who doesn't? Um, in fact, in the book, the latter half of the book, I challenge him on one of those character defects, and he very uncomfortably owns it. He, to use a phrase that is often used in the recovery community, when you come clean, he hugged the cactus. He was able to come clean, hug the cactus, admit to some things that. Look, I've been pastoring for many years. Very difficult to get people to admit to anything. I mean, uh, we, we could pick on David Berkowitz. He's pretty easy to pick on and say, you know, uh, he's the bad guy that makes us feel like a good guy. But the reality is most people have a problem admitting their character defects. True. Now, it's interesting you were saying you spent all the time with him, et cetera. I have not heard of many serial killers where they show any growth. The only other one I can think of is Ed Kemper. I have read and understand that he is not the same person who was arrested in the 70s. I think John Douglas, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, of the FBI, commented that Ed Kemper was kind of different um, than yeah, a they lot say of that because it, it was They unusual. say that because Kemper is a very self-reflective individual. Um, he's, done the whole, he's done the work when it comes to introspection, you know, really looking within, not, not blaming, not playing the blame game. Um, a lot of these guys, serial killers included, I've worked in the prison's uh, chaplaincy ministry for a while, so I know a lot of these guys play the blame game. I mean, if you talk to them long enough, they're the victim. They're the ones that were cheated uh, by the justice system, by their victims, by whoever. Uh, they, they very much perceive themselves as the victim, and they feel very justified in what they did. Uh, a guy like Kempa, if you listen to him in his interviews, that's not the case. He uh, he owns it. Like Berkowitz, I'd say he has to stay put to satisfy the standards of justice of society. Um, but you know, if 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 there's been some growth or progress, I think it's important that we point that out. And I think that I think you're right. I think that Kempa does fall into that category of one that's experienced some growth. Okay. And now with you interviewing a lot of people, is that unusual for that kind of growth to take place? Yeah. I mean, it's work, you know, look, Isaac Newton, first law of motion, everything stays in a state of inertia until something comes along from the outside, some pressure, some power and pushes it. It compels it to move. So, you know, we're, we're bent towards inertia. We kind of like, how many times you meet a friend, right? You, you haven't seen the guy in maybe 25 years. You went to high school with him. <laughs> You're like, this guy's still the same. He's still telling, telling the same stories. It's the same idiosyncrasies. Like nothing's changed. Um, I could say that that's pretty much the story for most people. Uh, and yeah, if you've committed some enormous crimes, the enormity of the crime is probably going to contribute to a greater degree of stuckness because to grow means to face what I did and to face what I did means in the case of David Berkowitz gunned down 13 people hurt many. I mean, countless lives. So to face that reality, which is the only way of going forward, transformation begins when denial ends to face that reality, to hug that kind of cactus, um, is no easy thing. So yeah, there's probably a higher degree of stuckness amongst your criminal population because of the enormity of the misdeeds. Fair enough. Now, I want to pivot a little bit because when you were talking to David Berkowitz, I haven't heard it firsthand, but from my understand, you got some clarifications of what he actually did tell Maury Terry or if he lied to Maury Terry or if Maury Terry used him, I'm not sure which I, I know that there was a documentary on Netflix called sons of Sam. And I read the beyond evil or listened to most of it and found the book to be interesting for a while. And then it kind of piled on every conspiracy thought or idea imaginable saying that David Berkowitz was part of a, a whole group of killers 
that tied to something called the process, which ultimately then tied him to Charles Manson. It was just kind of like this big snowball of, of craziness. And then when I saw the interview that Maury Terry did of David Berkowitz that was in the documentary, um, I noticed that he was not asking open-ended questions. Everything was a closed-ended question, and I felt like he was feeding a story to David Berkowitz. So to clarify, did Maury Terry and his book come up in your discussions with David Berkowitz. You know, it's pretty comical is uh, when I began my relationship with David Berkowitz, I hardly knew who Maury Terry or the ultimate evil is the title. Uh, his book, The Ultimate Evil, I, I hardly knew that that even existed. I mean, I, I sort of heard it in the background somewhere. Uh, my stepfather who raised me is from the Bronx. So, you know, some stories passed around in that area. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from Providence, Rhode Island, a couple of hours away from New York City, but went to New York all the time as a kid. I was kind of home away from home. So sort of heard it in the background, but didn't really know much of it. It, it really had nothing to do with me meeting with David. Um, and I, I'm glad that I was not deeply entrenched in any particular viewpoint, whether, you know, you have the viewpoint of the lone gunman, he did it by himself, or there was cult involvement. None of that was in my, my thought process. I just, I was there to meet David Berkowitz, to understand the mental health factors behind his crimes, to build a relationship. Because when you, you know, you do something like this, trust, building a, a good solid rapport, um, you know, communicating to someone, me communicating to David, that I'm not there to push him in a particular direction. I have no agenda. I'm just trying to find out the truth. Um, what's often referred to in behavioral science is tactical empathy, meaning you form an, emp an empathetic bond with someone and it, it becomes tactical. Tactical, not in a manipulative way. Um, manipulation would be to try to move him towards my agenda, but tactical in the sense that it would be strategic in helping him open up and talk about uh, exactly what he wants to talk about and not what I'm coercing him uh, to speak on. So I was very careful with that. I wanted David to know, look, I have no agenda. You, you, this is your story. You tell it. And over the course of the 100 hours, I started to detect um, surrounding the subject of the cult and the crimes, um, a bit of neurosis, some defensiveness, even some factual inconsistencies, because I'd gone back and listened to the Maury Terry interview. And then I had listened. Obviously, I'd, I'd collected my own data, meeting with David for 34 sessions. And uh, between the factual inconsistencies, some of the neurosis surrounding the crimes, like behaviors that kind of showed me he had a secret, something he, he wanted to talk about, but he, he just wasn't sure how to approach the subject. Um, it eventually led to a chapter I describe at the end of the book uh, where David sets the record straight. And the re setting the record straight meant acknowledging that there was some cult involvement, not in the crimes, but in the backdrop, that he he definitely wanted to belong. He had this need to fit in. It had been a part of his development from the time he was a little kid. Interestingly enough, David was always a part of groups, but he was always sort of on the fringes of the group. Um, you know, he was part of baseball teams, Appalachian Mountain Club, where he climbed mountains with friends, um, the military. Uh, you know, riding bikes with kids in the neighborhood. But he sort of always still maintained this rogue maverick status, even when he was a part of the group per se. And that sort of pattern of behavior goes back to early childhood. I, I think it even followed him in, into the 70s. And I, I think that he was a part of this group, as he says he was, and it definitely played a role in some of his thinking patterns. Uh, but when it came to the actual crimes, what he told Maury Terry in that uh, I believe 1993 Inside Edition interview and what he told me uh, were two different stories. And I can tell you there was a great deal of relief that David felt after he came clean. I don't think that I made him come clean. I think that he was wanting to for a long time and he'd been living under the albatross of guilt and shame for a long time because he wants to make things right. He believes he's going to face God He's had some serious health concerns, 
uh, with his heart. And uh, he wants to be right on that day when he faces God. So he's trying to make things right on this day. Interesting. So um, that's that was a 93 interview. So that's five years after he converted. So was the conversion a gradual thing or did he actually convert? Do, do you know of any conversion that is sudden? I mean, change doesn't happen Tip, suddenly. Yeah. Change, changes happen mm -hmm. subtly. They don't happen all at once. Nobody. I don't, I mean, I've pastored Christians for years. Even myself, I've been walking with Jesus for 28 years. I still have some hangups, some bad habits. Um, I was, I gave my life to Christ at, in a juvenile detention center. I robbed cars, broke into homes, grew up just on the streets, not a good guy. Gave my life to Christ in, as a teenager. And the change that he did in me was process, like anybody else. So the idea that he was converted in 1988 and he told a lie in 1993 and therefore his conversion isn't real. I mean, that kind of black and white polarized thinking, I just think it's a harsh assessment. And I think that we probably should take the plank out of our own eye before we, uh, you know, spend too much time on his, on what's in his eye. Fair enough. I'm just asking the questions that I know are coming up. <laughs> no, I know. Listen, I don't mean that. No disrespect <laughs> to you. I, my my combativeness is not directed to you as the host. It's more to the uh, the suspicion in the general public towards David Berkowitz because he didn't get it right five years after his conversion. Well, and that's part of my question, too, is I'm not trying to beat him up on this because as far as I see it. Maury Terry could have been using him for his own agenda. I, I wouldn't doubt that. I don't yeah. know. But, that. you know, so th there are two sides to it. There's two people in that interview. And there is a very famous book that's still being fought over to this day that came out of that odd relationship. So I, I'm more than happy to say that there's potentially more to it. So ultimately... Did Berkowitz say, yes, I did, in fact, kill these people? Yeah, he did. He, uh, and, you know, I think it's important that the reader experience that part of our journey together, David and I, for themselves, and actually purchase the book and read the chapter. Because, it, you know, I'm a little reluctant in saying how it happened. I don't want it to come across as glib. It was a process and it was a real like peeling back of an onion. But when you finally got to the core of the onion, when the levees finally broke and, and David spilt his guts, he said with great sorrow, I did this. I'm responsible for these crimes. And I lied. And, uh, I, you know, I, I left that, that session with more respect for David because, again, he hugged the cactus. Now, look, I, I know I might come across to some as some fanboy for serial killers, but that's just not how it is. Um, you know, I, I've worked with these guys for a long time. My compassion towards inmates goes back to me being a kid visiting my dad in prison. Um, this, this relationship is sincere, and it was a sincere confession. It was a man trying to come out from under the weight of the albatross of guilt and shame that had been on him for a long, long time. Okay, well, on that note, you had mentioned that, you know, the relationship and stuff. So you visited with him 100 hours. Are you still corresponding with him? I mean, do you still have a relationship? Because that would kind of, that would be a little tough. Like you build, you get the really close relationship. It's like, okay, book's done. Um, how, how is that relationship going? He just going? called me this morning. Uh, we probably speak on the phone once a week. I visit him now, okay. I want to say once every three weeks. I don't really let a month go by without without driving the three hours uh, to see him. Uh, when we were doing the analysis, it was more like maybe once every other week, so it was more frequent. We were talking on the phone probably two, three times a week. Um, but now it's probably once a week on the phone, two times a week email. Um, it's kind of comical when you're in a social setting and people don't really know. I mean, this is not the case anymore. Most people know you know, about our relationship. They know about the book. They've seen me on the 700 Club. They've seen me on different t uh, t talk shows. But when they don't know, and I'm mi mixed company, my cell phone, the uh, the only thing I was working on it was the speakerphone because the something was wrong with the earpiece. And I'm sitting at a dinner and I, I 
I take the call and it says, you've got to collect call from David Berkowitz <laughs> at Shawcon Correctional. Everybody at the table is looking at me like, what? what? <laughs> but yeah, we've continued a relationship. I don't believe in instrumental relationships where you just kind of use people for your own agenda. I have a genuine concern for the guy. I want to see him do well. Um, I would consider him a friend. And I know that being his friend is like standing in a drop zone on a construction site where rocks can fall on your head any second. Um, I've certainly experienced some of those rocks. Uh, but hey, Jesus was a friend of the sinner. He was a friend of the worst of the worst, tax collectors, prostitutes, people that nobody wanted to affiliate with. And that's, that's the price I pay in being a follower of Christ is sometimes you're friends with people that are not the most popular in society. As a last question, because obviously you're building a relationship and you're hopefully learning, what have you learned from David Berkowitz that has changed your views as a person or has profoundly affected you in some yeah, way? Yeah, well, you know what? It's all stated in the title. I called it Monster Mirror because I thought in hearing David's story uh, back in the 70s when he was doing the crimes, uh, the, the murders, when he's committing those awful murders, um, I thought that I would hear the story of a monster. But I, I found myself more looking into a mirror. Um, when I collected all my data, 100 hours of interviews, semi-structured, and I did my, uh, what's known as thematic analysis, where you're looking for themes that keep emerging. And I'm paying attention to these themes. Nine themes surfaced. I talk about those nine themes in the book. Isolation, resentment, uh, shame. When I look at those themes, I see that these themes are not exclusive to serial killers. They're themes that affect most people on some level. And I walked away thinking, this is not a monster. This is a mirror. And the line between the quote unquote psychopath and the general population is a lot thinner than we like to imagine. You know, back in the 1700s when men were executed, it was usually done publicly in London. And a guy by the name of John Bradford was present for one of those executions. And the entire town was calling this man, every name in the book, you know, he committed some crime, he was being executed. John ba Bradford stood up tall, he pointed to the man, and he said, there but for the grace of God, so go I. And what he meant was, you know, you see a monster, but I see a mirror, and that could have been me. And that's really the message of this book. That's what I, I learned from sitting with David Berkowitz, is that the line between him and the general population, or between him and me, is a lot thinner than we'd like to imagine. And I believe that there's a potential, a potential psychopath in everyone, given the wrong choices and the right succession of events, you'd be shocked at what anyone could evolve into. Okay, well, um, and that spun another question. I'll try not to dwell too long, but you mentioned visiting two other serial killers, and I'm guessing that they were before. Oh, yeah, David one Berkowitz? of them goes back 20 years. Uh, one of them was over a long period of time. And then the other one was more short. It was like, I don't know, a year and a half, two years or something. Okay, so with that previous experience, did David surprise you? Like, did you walk in expecting, okay, I've been with the serial killers, I know the games, or, you know, or whatever that they play, and then you met David Berkowitz and felt like you met a different person? Um, I think I expected more from David than the prior to because I had seen David over a long period of time from a distance in the media, you know, with the 700 Club interview. Um, I seen his testimony play out for decades. The other two, you know, their references to religion were not very long-term and they were not very consistent. And it became clear that it was more part of a manipulative agenda uh, you know, in, in going before a parole board. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Now, um, I said last question before, but this actually is the last question and it's this, what is the one question that I should have asked you, but I did not. 
what changed David Berkowitz? And the answer I'd give to that is... What changed David uh, Berkowitz? The answer I'd give to that is a very vibrant, active faith in Jesus Christ. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to put a link to your book um, and uh, an Amazon link in the description so anybody can go out and get it. I hope that you consider putting in an audio book at some point because many people who listen to podcasts and watch YouTube prefer audio books. Just it's the way they ingest the information. 